All right, let's see if this is working. Um, I don't know the browser. Let's fix that. Sorry about that. Let's just go see if we're here. It's still you. But no, now it's me. Ha ha. Alright. Into the matrix. Alright, let's go to github.com slash Dallas. First thing I wanted to work on. Let's uh let me close this one down. Close that down. So the first thing I wanted to work on is specification. See if the issues I was having with that have been resolved. Hey, I'm now live. Sweet. So let's go find that specification project right here. And... I don't remember if I'm going to end up using this EF core one or not. I think it's going to be just be this one. All right, so let's make sure I've got the thing downloaded. Dev GitHub should have it here. I do. Let's open up PowerShell and see what our status is. I am on integration tests, which I was fighting with, and couldn't get to work. I'm not sure what my changes were to specification. Let's let's just commit them. Whatever they were. All right, now that's going to kick off a build. I think. Let's see if I can actually log into my build server today. It's always a challenge because it's using Microsoft authentication and it's really hard to sign in with that sometimes. Uh, I don't know. This is the part that sucks. It's the same email address. You tell me. Let's try this one. It's going to work? Of course not. Or is it? Oh look, I'm logged in, but now I'm not logged into the right organization. Great. Nope. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to github.com, microdallas, specification. Let's try again. Let's try and sign in. Uh, that one. Try another account. Yeah? Let's try that. Maybe? Oh, no, of course not. Hmm. I wonder if I need to sign in. Maybe I don't need to sign in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nothing like live streaming how much Microsoft's account system is vexing me. Alright, so here, let's just look and see what we've got. And see if this is working. Has that worked? Or at least it was green. Run Docker Compose. Hello, Surly Dev. All right, those of you just joining me, I'm trying to get back to this uh, issue I had with our Dallas specification. It's a NuGet package, All right? So if we go to NuGet.org and we search for our Dallas dot specification, it shows up here. It's had a couple people download it, um, and what I want is for the build to run with code coverage out in. Uh, Azure DevOps. So I did. I've had an accounts issue where I need to reset my Microsoft account on my computer, install something that will let me reset my personal PIN, and just tries to make a reset my company account PIN. Yeah. 
No, the Microsoft account system is just a nightmare. And I'm t one reason why I'm probably going to get off of Azure DevOps and just use GitHub Actions, because you know how many times GitHub has asked me whether I want to use my work or school or church or personal or cult or terrorist or whatever organization account? It never has. It just asks for my login, and it works. It's amazing. Um, Microsoft, on the other hand, wants to always ask that stupid question and then never works no matter which one I pick. So it's annoying. All right, so we're going to see if this works. Let's talk about what this is doing. So open this up. Let's go find that. And that is a bit frustrating at times. Yeah, let me tell you. Because I have a lot of accounts. I have a lot of projects. And the other thing that's annoying is when I go to create a new Azure DevOps thing, half the time it creates it in a new organization, like from a GitHub repo. Um, and sometimes it'll use an existing one. And it's probably all my fault, I recognize. If I were more careful, if I made sure that I was using the correct work or school or personal or private or organizational or charity or whatever account, then I wouldn't have this problem. But I, I still think it maybe shouldn't be all on me to figure all that out. Um, all right, let's close all the documents. Let's look at this Docker file. Here's what we're running in the build right now is... Uh, What's in the shop? Your UFO. Legendary Moo. Alright, so I have a Docker file that will run my tests uh, in the cloud as part of the build, which is pretty cool. In fact, I can run them here. Alright, so if I come in here and I say run those tests, let's see if it works locally. Uh, well, it helps if I start Docker. Let's start Docker. Docker. All right. You guys following Mark Miller? I've been busy all week. I haven't been on anybody else's streams. All right, so Docker is starting, you see here. And when that's done, we'll be able to check that. Meanwhile, over here, this thing is running, but it failed. And why did it fail? Look at this, we got 100% code coverage. This all looks great. And then, dun, 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 that, that was good. Okay, this. All right, this is still the same error. Okay, so we're not gonna do a whole lot more with this. Okay, so I guess I could just comment this out and, and call it a day, but this is what I was hoping to get working. And I have a GitHub issue out there uh, for Microsoft to fix this, and they haven't done it yet. Um, and it's been like a month and a half. Like, when's the last time I ran this build? Um, all right, that was a few weeks ago. A few, okay, maybe it hasn't been that long, but it's been a while. They should fix it. Um, two weeks. Two weeks should be plenty of time. All right. all right, so let me go back out here, go in here, comment out, publish my. See, this bug workaround did not work. And control K, control C doesn't work in a YAML file, so do it by hand. And dir dir dir, this is all additional debug stuff that wasn't working because it's not my bug. I'm just going to be bashing Azure DevOps all day today, I guess. All right, publish test results. This is what blows. No, publish code coverage results is what blows up. All right, publish code coverage, yeah. Um, so we're going to get rid of that. All right, and then do all the other things. So we'll save that, we'll commit that, um, and we'll pull request it, because I'm tired of this thing sitting out there in a separate branch. Okay, so now if I go back to code coverage results should be automatically, well, you would think. Um, I don't think they are. If we go back to GitHub, let's go back to GitHub. It should help me out and say, hey, do you want to do a pull request? Maybe? 
Maybe not because I own it. Um, but I can make it do it. That one. Look at all the stuff I did. It's been forever since I started this work. Um, view that pull request. Oh, I already had one? I already had one. Alright, fine. Um, yeah, so... If this build succeeds, we will merge it. So let's go back here, let's look at builds. There's the one. That one failed, but this one hopefully will pass. Code Stencil, what are you working on today? Well, I've got a bunch of open source projects, and I thought I would make some updates to some of them. Like this one that's been hanging out there for a while, I've been wanting to get this pull request merged in here for this... In fact, it's been out there so long I didn't even remember I had this pull request from July. I thought I had to make a new one, but um, merging this thing in, and finally, and what this uh, specification package, uh, NuGet package does, is it takes the specification logic that's in eShop on web and puts it into a reusable um, format. So if you're not familiar with that, here's your five second introduction. This is Octotree. Octotree is a Chrome plugin. It's really nice. It gives you this tree view. You can come in here. You can say, hey, here are my specifications. Specification is basically like a query encapsulated in an object. You can do stuff like encapsulate your filter. You can do stuff like encapsulate the fact that you want to use an include. You can also say, you know what? I think I want to use paging. And so you can put in skip and take so that you can support paging in addition to filtering. And then apply the paging. All that makes it so that your repository, or your data layer, or whatever you want to use here, does not get extended with lots and lots of different query methods. Instead, you just create a list method that takes in a specification, and then use a specification evaluator to apply the query, and to apply the includes, and the order buys, and the grouping, and the paging. Right, And so this makes it so you don't end up with link expressions with query information scattered all over your controllers and services and everything else. Legendary Moo says, look at the test step. Did it break? Because you guys could watch this too, you know. Um, it's right there. It's public. All right. I uh, thought the code coverage results were automatically published. Legendary, look at the test step in your... Oh, is that regarding the publishing? Um, I don't know. Test step, test step, test step. That's this. It makes these test result files. Publish test results. So do that. Test step is saying just run my. Uh, yeah, this Docker Compose up is my test step because Docker Compose is what is running all my tests, I believe. As in the step that runs the test. Right, that's the Docker Compose thing. So this Docker Compose, when this gets around to being done, it's going to run all the tests. It's it's, uh, it's funny that way. I was going to show that on localhost, but I had to start Docker, which now has been done. So let's uh, let's show what that looks like. Um, run tests, right? So here's what the running the tests look like on local. You can see in the background it's doing it out there too. Um, and so this thing runs a SQL Server container and a bunch of integration tests. And so right now it's waiting for that database to wake up, which it just did. And now it's, you can see it's starting up the database. And once the database is started, the integration test will kick off. And the integration test will run the uh, queries using specifications against that database. And so there are the tests ran. There's my code coverage. There's some more tests that are running. Those were integration tests, the first ones. These were my uh, integrate, those were unit tests, the first ones. These are my integration tests, now the second ones. So the integration tests here have 100% code coverage. They did all the things. And now we're tearing down the container. And we're good. All right. That is YAML. All right, yeah. Um, all right, so that's what I want to have run in Azure DevOps. And that works, right? Uh, the part that's not working is, is the publishing uh, test coverage results, which I commented out. So that's out of there now. All right, so that's green, and since that's green, I can come over here, and I can go back to my pull request from ages ago, and it's got a nice green check now, meaning I can merge it. C-sharp Frit said this morning that I gave a reason 
Why to include empty line before and after single line methods? Didn't get the beginning of the explanation. Why do that? Um, I don't know. I don't know what that's referring to. I'll do a merge request. Sh tell me an example. Are you talking about like when I call a single line method or? Confirm merge. All right, so that's great. Delete that branch. Come over here. Check out master, git pull, zoinks. All right, now let's go here and reload. And let's go look at a, I'm sure somewhere I've got a single line method here. Is that what you mean? That's a single line method. Are you seeing code stencil? Are you saying I would do something like this? I would never do that. I would probably do one line between each thing, right? That's pretty typical. Um, but but that's about it. Am I answering your question? Are you paying attention? So I don't know what uh, what Fritz was referencing. Yes, when it returns. When it returns, like if it's not a void method. These are all void methods. I don't have an example here. That's got a return. There's no. I think I'm still not understanding you. I, empty line before and after single line methods. I'm not seeing it. Unless you mean that and that. Maybe somebody else besides me suggested something to Fritz. But this is this is pretty much how I format things. Which I think is how almost everybody else does. So I don't think it's anything unique. All right, um, is that good? Is Fritz still running? I should ping him and tell him to send his people over here when he's done. Oh, and I should also um, promote my thing for .NET Conf next week. So if you're going to be watching, yeah, Code Stencil, if you find the, the bit that you were talking about, just paste it in here. Fritz just went offline. Well, he should he should be sending people to me, man. He's probably sending them to, to Ed because he's talking about Blazor. And he wants to pimp Blazor more than uh, random open source stuff. So, Which I can understand. Um, Alright, so next week, .NET Conf. Right, let's see. Do they have a website with a schedule, maybe? .NET Conf. That. Uh, there is an agenda. I saw their agenda. Um, I am going to be presenting on day three at like four o'clock, something like that. I don't know, am I on here somewhere? Me. Um, 13.30, okay, so, yeah, plus three, 4.30 my time, right? So, uh, I'm going to be talking about this eShop on web application next Wednesday at 4.30 Eastern Time. So you can catch me there if you want. He hosted Imperial. I don't even know who Imperial is. He must be another one of our uh, coding streamers, though. Um, but yeah, so check out this schedule for .NET Conf for next week. There's lots of cool stuff happening. Um, everything's being uh, announced and published and released, so it'll be a good time. Imperial Girl. Okay, still don't know her, but I'm sure she's awesome. If she's, uh, she's got Fritz uh, promoting her. Alright, so this, uh, this is good to go. I'm going to not worry about specification anymore today. Um, let me check out my other open source things. I figured I'd spend like the first hour or so just doing some open source maintenance stuff and answering questions anybody has and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, I'm going to do a kata, I think, for the second half, which will also be open source because I'll probably uh, create a repo and throw it out there. So let's go back here and look at my other projects. Clean architecture needs an update to 3.0. Maybe we could work on that for a little bit. I um, don't think I've started that, have I? Not for this one. Yeah, so let's, let's do a 3.0 update on this. We'll see how that goes. So I believe I've already got it downloaded on this machine. So close the solution 
and we will look for clean architecture somewhere. Shrink dev GitHub clean architecture. There we go. And that's all that. Let's close all the documents. And then let's go over here, because I like this better. Clean. I think I'm up to date. Hey, I'm up to date. All right, let's create a new branch. Git checkout dash b um, net 3.0 update. All right, how many of you have done the .NET Core 3 update process? Anybody? There's a nice doc for it. Um, let's find that. Uh, ASP.NET docs migration 3.0 that. So you can go through this document uh, and it kind of walks you through what you need to do. It doesn't catch everything. I've, I've already hit a few things that it didn't catch and I've opened some issues so hopefully it'll get better. Um, but uh, but it's, it's not it's not bad and it's actually the whole process is not too bad. Um, there's not that much that changed really in ASP.NET Core 3.0. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just update my Net Core app here to 3.0 and so we'll jump back over here We'll go to our web app and change it. And this is going to immediately break some other things, um, specifically my tests. And also, uh, this package reference goes away. I wonder if this will change on you come Monday. Um, well, no. I mean, uh, the, the latest preview bits that I'm going to use are pretty much what they're going to go live with Monday, I think. And even if they're not, it's going to be like, oh, I have to change a version number. All right, so this needs to come out of there. Um, and he's, well, I mean, Bentley Core is open source, right? You can see what all they're working on. So it's not like they're going to have this big reveal on Monday and be like, oh, actually, we were building this entirely different thing. Um, right, I think I'm going to have to mess with these. I'll leave them there for now. But let's see how this builds. The first thing that's going to break are anything I have referencing that, specifically my tests. So you're going to see a lot of these. They say, hey, uh, if you're targeting Net Core App 3, you can't reference this. Sorry, go away, Siri. Um, from a thing that uses 2.2. And that's going to be my unit test, my functional test, my integration test, all the test projects. So I basically just need to take this framework guy there and apply the same thing to each one of my test projects. So it it kind of spreads, right? Once you start down the path of 3.0, forever will it dominate your destiny. Um, all right, do that. I forget that's how MS is working on things. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it used to be that you could have a totally breaking change come out of the blue, but I'm pretty confident that's not going to happen now, not because I have special NDA knowledge, but because I have GitHub. All right. Um, okay, so now let's see what other things are breaking. Um, so here's the thing. There is a huge number of libraries that get yanked out of the NetCore app thing. All right, so for one thing, this, this NetCore app thing, ASP.NetCore.app, uh, is no longer there. And here it's telling you, hey, we removed some assemblies that were previously part of this. Uh, and when they say some, they mean like a lot. So all kinds of things that you normally got in that uh, meta package you now have to add manually. So that uh, announcement, let's see, ASP.NET Core 3.0 GitHub announcements, I think that's probably a good spot to look. And they talked about breaking removal of components, that's not it. Maybe it's been a while, I thought it was pretty close to the top. Yeah, it was recent. Removing. I guess they're on place. ASP.NET announcement removing packages. Something like that. Somebody's being removed. There we go. From October of 2018. Wow. That's not new. Uh, anyway, this list is fairly long. And so these are all the things that you now need to reference directly if you're using anything in them. Specifically, in my case, what I need is EF Core, 
EF Core, SQL Server, EF Core in memory. So those are going to be things I'm going to need to use. Um, let's start with that EF Core in memory because I know I need that. And I want to know the version number. So you can come out here. And here's a neat trick you may not know. Um, this little guy here, if you do package reference, copy, it'll give you the XML you need for the package reference. Which you probably all already knew that, but uh, if not, maybe that's helpful. So here, um, I have that commented out, so it's not needing it right now. Let's try this one. I think this one needed. Well, let's just look at our errors. That would be smart. All right, so that one, functional tests doesn't have it. That one, integration tests doesn't have it. So those are the two I need. So here's integration tests. We will get rid of that and add that. All right, and then functional tests will do the same. Get rid of ASP.NET Core app and add that. All right, let's build again, see what we do. My phone just decided to restart for no apparent reason. Somebody's hacking my phone. Alright, service collection does not have... I fixed that. Yeah, see? I click on it, it fixes it. Interesting. Zero errors. Alright, so I think we're in mostly good shape. Look that, build succeeded. Woohoo! Alright, let's go back to our, uh, our list, though. Um... And you know what? I'll be nice and paste this link into the chat. And then this other link here into the chat. There you go. So if you guys are following along. And hey, while we're at it, here's the .NET Conf agenda. So you can check me out next week. Okay. So now we need to add package references for removed assemblies. Did that. That was easy. Analyzers. I don't, I'm not doing anything with analyzers. Razor language version. I um, must set the Rachel I don't have any Razor class library projects, so that's not a thing. Um, that's okay. Kestrel changes. Um, so instead of using create web builder, web host builder, uh, it just is now create default builder. So I'm going to steal this code right here. I'm going to go into my program.cs here. And notice that this used to just say create web host builder. All right, now it's going to look like this. Create host builder. And inside of there, inside of there, it's going to say configure web host default. So at the end of the day, it's doing the same thing um, as it was before. But now it's not web specific on the, on the, on the outside because of the new host features that they have. Basically, if you want to build a service or a console app or whatever, and you want built-in dependency injection support, like the service container, you want logging, you want configuration, you can get all that stuff if you just build a host without it being coupled to web, without it being a part of ASP.NET Core. All right, so we get rid of this now, and I don't really like how this looks. We do that. I'm not sure I like that any better. But maybe if I format it a little nicer. Host dot create that dot that. Right. And that can go there. And that can go there. And that can go maybe there. I guess this could all go in. That I can follow. All right, so now I just need to call this. Yeah, Control KD normally works, but not when you're being like arbitrary with your stuff, like whether or not this thing matches that thing. Control KD just goof that up. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should do that and that. Oh, that looks horrible. I should do that. But now that matches that. That's okay. So that should go 
There. There. But control KD. Oh, that's alright. Thank you for following DES. DES. You should install the new Cascadia code font. Um, alright. How do I do that? I could do that. Install Microsoft Roslyn Analyzers. Um, not right now. I'm pretty happy with Consolas as a code font. What's Cascadia do for me? Alright. Um, let's see if this builds. I think it does. Wow, more people following. Thank you, Shmoli Yang. Cascadia code. Alright. Copy, open, open. Okay. Yeah, I've heard about this. And it probably has ligatures, I'm guessing. It has glyphs. I don't know, this looks fine. Yeah, I'm not sure I like ligatures, honestly. Alright, we'll, we'll think about that. I'm not, I'm not convinced yet. Alright, I think uh, this this whole process might have been easier than I was thinking it would be, because we might be done, which would be kind of cool. But let's uh, let's run our tests. So test, window, boom. Let's think about our tests for a while. There we go. Run all the tests. The unit tests should totally pass. And they do. Alright, functional tests are not happy. So let's look at that. There is no public static iWeb host builder. Well, that sounds familiar. Shouldn't that be a compile error? Does this need to be an iHost builder now, maybe? Surly Dev, I had a question, but I can't read my notes now. Okay. I have a question for you, then. Why can't you read your notes? Do you have bad handwriting? Alright. That no longer works. So how do I fix that? Maybe that's in the upgrade document. Let us hope. I don't remember seeing that though. So okay, I fixed this. That works fine now. Okay. Connection adapters have been removed from Kestrel. I'm not using that. Transport abstractions moved or made public. I don't think I'm doing anything with that. Kestrel, Kestrel, I'm not doing any of this fancy stuff. I'm not doing that. JSON.net, I don't think I'm doing too much of that. Partway through watching your extension methods and guard clauses video we did with Jeff. Okay, a while ago. Service registration. Um, yeah, I could change how I'm doing that. The thing about this is um, I don't have a different clean architecture template for MVC versus API versus Razor Pages, so I have all those things, right? So I've got a little bit of API and a little bit of pages and a little bit of controllers and views. So in startup, where now I could say, hey, register uh, controllers, but not all of the things, um, then the new things aren't really good for me. Right? I think I can do this one, though, with the default routes, though, which I prefer now. With the default route, because it saves a few lines of code. And does the same thing. Alright. But it's not supported when using endpoint routing. Code stencil subscribed. Awesome. Thanks, man. Um, I was watching the updated course on Pluralsight, and the whole guard clause bit was pretty neat. Cool. Thank you. I like guard clauses. We could look at that open source uh, thing as well if you want. Um, yeah, so I do need to change this because now it needs to use endpoint routing, and I'm not doing that. So let's let's just cheat and create a new app and make an ASP.NET Core web app. Uh, that's all fine. I'm 
and grab the code for that. So let's do an MVC, nothing else, create. So when you're saying you can't see your notes, are you looking for plural site notes? Oh wait, no, that's legendary move that was talking about that. Not you, all right. I didn't write enough context down, got it. All right, so we're gonna look at the new startup file in this new thing. And notice it says, hey, use endpoints and also use routing. So I need to steal those two things. Um, and also it would help if I run the application sometime to see if it works. So use routing, where should I put that? I think it should go here. That looks good. And then app.use endpoints. I just went and switched this to this nice short method. And now it's long again. Is there a map default controller routes? I don't know. Um, use endpoints. I've got a slide deck that talks about all the different ones of these I need, because I need three different types of use endpoints. I need map controller route. Let me see if I can find that slide deck. Actually, it's just, it was from this page. Services, that's not it. Services, services, that's all fine. Yeah, it's going to be down here. Map routes, map controller routes, health checks. Somewhere you're going to show me how to do all the things. There we go. Uh, no, still not. Running out of room. Not there. All right, where'd I see it? I don't need SignalR. I'm not using that in this template. Um, but I am not using health checks either. That's all services. I am using Razor Pages, so I need that. You know, I could probably just use IntelliSense. Let's see. Razor Pages, yes. I also need map controllers. Map what? Blazer, not using Blazer yet. Areas, uh, no areas. Connections, controllers I need. That's used by attribute routing on my APIs. Controller route, that's for MVC. I think that's all I need. All right. Add back on your list. All right, good, surly dev. Um, okay. So that's that's all good. Let's see if this thing runs. And then we'll get back to figuring out why those functional tests don't work. Mm, returning an iService provider isn't supported. What? Did they break that? Alright, 3.0. How do I do how do I do a custom service provider? Nothing. Do I have to do it in program CS and inject it there? Is that what they're doing now? Um, hmm. Well, let's just search for the error, right? Not supported. Boom. The issue. Not supported. Service provider. Yeah, how do I do this now? Okay, so let's, Autofac is what I'm using, I think, pretty sure. Um, build my provider, new container builder, from Autofac. All right, so Autofac, how do I do that now? Configure Autofac in this. Right, okay, so it is moved up into the host builder. That makes sense. So it's not going to be in startup anymore. Alright, well, this just got a little more interesting. Do do. Configure container. Okay. Alright, 
configure container, use service provider factory. Okay, well, that's different. Um, let's look at this one. So we're definitely on ASP.NET Core 3 Preview 5 or higher. All right, so host builder, create host builder, create default builder. This needs to be that, that's right. That's how it usually used to be. I don't know, I kind of like that this thing just returned the iService provider, but, but that's fine, we'll do that. So this needs to go away. Okay. All right, a few changes to conform to the new syntax. You need to plug in the service provider factory for AutoFact. So create default builder, use service provider factory, new AutoFact thing. Okay, let's try that. So that's gonna go in program.cs and down here, host.create default builder, create default builder, let's put it right here and pull in some namespace. Okay, now what? Configure web host defaults. Blah, 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 blah. Then, in the configure container method, that's a thing, of your startup class, register things directly into an autofact container builder. All right, so there's that. This is taken directly from the Autofact documentation. Yay. Okay, cool. Do that, do that. So the Autofact container now gets injected in here somehow. Interesting. So I need one of those. Copy that. Uh, come back to startup. Put that right there private set, so I don't know where it's getting set from, but we'll find out. Configure containers where you can register things directly with AutoFact. This runs after configure services. Don't build the container that's done for you. If you need a reference to the container, okay, so... Here's where we set it, inside configure. That's weird. All right, is that what the other one said to do too? I didn't talk about it. Configures where you're middleware, right. So it sounds like it's optional to have to have a reference to that thing. I'm not sure I'd need one. But I do need a configure container. So I need one of these. So let's put that here. Okay, and then we'll... No, do I have a module? I think I have an auto effect module. I can do other things, right? I can do builder.populate. Yeah, right, I can do all these things here. But I don't have that services collection in here. I just have the builder. So there, add services, don't build a return that, or else this won't get called. Or else it'll actually just blow up and tell me it's not supported. Um, all right. This will override registrations made there. Okay. Let's 
but apparently it works with those things. So maybe I don't have to do, I don't have to do this anymore. I probably don't have to do this anymore, it sounds like. Maybe I still want to do this. So what this is doing is fetching, so we'll leave that there. This reflection-based stuff is going out to get the different assemblies, web assembly, core assembly, infrastructure assembly, and registering implemented interfaces. So if there's an interface and it's been implemented, it just registers all of them. So I don't have to do it. Um, okay, so then this is no longer being used. Mark that for getting rid of later. I don't think, I don't think I needed this. I think that was just an example of how to get it if I needed it. All right, so now let's try and run this again and see how it blows up. Boom. Method not found, static file middleware. Okay. That's probably because I need that reference now, because, so I don't need that. Or that, or that, or that. This static file middleware, anyone? I don't see it here. I don't remember having to add anything to get static files working. App.use static files. Alright, what's my error again? In swashbuckle. Swashbuckle create static file middleware. Right, why is swashbuckle having this issue? Swagger UI middleware. Alright, let's see what. Uh, Swagger UI, USP.NET Core, 3.0, see if there's changes to this. Don't see it. This is ancient. Method not found. It's similar. Expected outcome. This is from 2017 now. So I don't think it's going to work. Install that. Okay, I might have to do that. Might have to make sure I get the latest swagger. So let's just do that. NuGet.org. Actually, we'll just use the tooling. Let's go in here. Manage NuGet packages. And let's look for installed swashbuckle ASP.NET Core. Let's try and update that and see what happens. Let's see, hosting environment's obsolete. Let's fix that real quick. My web host environment. So an error tells me what I need to do. I don't know why the autofix doesn't do it. There we go. All right, we got seven minutes left before I'm gonna switch gears and do a code kata. Type info. Apparently that's no longer a thing. Mm. Guess that. Hmm. Let's keep looking for nougat things. This thing fail. Did Fritz code stencil? What are you sending me? Did he do an upgrade today as well, or is this just some other? Oh, this is the thing you were talking about. All right, that's fine. I'll look at it. 
Alright. He's gonna say something like Steve Smith says. Forty-three, forty. Twenty. Mm, scrub forty-three. That's somebody who's. Um. Well, we needed to. Let's figure out if the. Well, if the train type isn't follower, stop processing. Well, that's easy. See, I can say if configuration dot type does not equal. Look at that. It turns it into the does not equal. That looks nice. Uh. Follow. Oh, Return. The ligature. That's easy. Right? Return uh, task completed task. Right. Okay. Um, I, sh I should surround that. Uh, what do we do? Right. So what's he trying to do? That's better. Right. Oh, I, I always wrap these. This is something that, that my friend Steve Smith, our Dallas here on Twitch, taught me. Hey, that's me. Even if you have one line to your if statement, and you can omit the the curly braces, unless it appears all as one line, wrap it in the curly braces anyway, so it's clear to somebody who's reading your code after the fact that this is the block that's going to be triggered by that if statement. Yes. And, Right, so you don't accidentally put something just before it, and then this return statement fires for everything because sure. the one line was before it. Yep. So, yep. Thank but, you for the shout out there, Hugo. Look at. That. All right, code stencil. I got you now. So that's an if statement, not a method. That's what was confusing me. Um, and it has nothing to do with the the white space, right? He's got a line sixty three and a line sixty five where he had extra carriage returns. You don't need that. That's just personal preference. But the curly brackets are the important part because this is a code block and it's legal to have a code block that doesn't have those curly brackets and it will literally just execute the next thing. With the curly brackets then if you come back to this later and you're like, oh wait, I also needed to do this one other thing, right? You will do the right thing by default if you add it to this block inside the curly brackets. Now the default that he's talking about um, behavior, let me show you an example. Like, uh, Let's say here, right? So this is the exact same thing. Like I could do that, but it would be still correct C sharp code to do that, right? But but the general best practice is not to do that because then if someone comes along and they're like, oh, well, I'll just do this and then I'll do, you know, something else, right? And obviously it'll run these two things, right? Well, no, no, it won't because the if statement only affects that one. It doesn't affect that one. Now, in this case, the else block makes it not work also. But if this weren't here, right, if it were like this, what's going to happen is if we're in an environment, that will run. And this will run no matter what, right? Because we didn't use the curly brackets. So that's the, that's the distinction that we're talking about here. All right. So why are you not happy? Oh, right. This went away. Um, dot um, environment name equals development there's probably an extension method for that somewhere but that'll fix the error all right good good cool it's a good question uh, i'm glad i got that sorted out for you now why is info not a thing in swashbuck or swagger let's just get rid of swagger for a second i would like this just to be able to run um, da, 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 da. That is an ugly error. I have no idea what you're even telling me. Let's try this. Compatibility version. Alright, I don't know that I need that anymore. So we'll get rid of that. There's going to be a little bit of comment cleanup happening here later. And package reference, right? I thought I'd get rid of those. Unit tests. Package reference. Right, that goes away because it's not a thing anymore. But now whatever it is that I was using that for, I'm going to have to pull in manually. All right, let's do a clean rebuild. Because I don't believe it when it says everything's good. Failed, see? Microsoft extensions, API description server targets 
doesn't like whatever the heck this is. I have no idea what this is doing. I don't even know how to search for that. MSB 3073? Maybe. Pre-build containing copy files. Okay. Maybe unlocking files with something? I don't know. Um, let's try and run it again. Oh, new error. Alright, well that makes sense. I pulled out the library, but I didn't kill the uh, middleware for Swagger. So... Got to also get rid of that, and that. I wonder if those use routing. They might have to be under routing. Okay, building still fails, but running works sometimes. Ooh, look at that, it builds. All right, since it ran, we're gonna use this opportunity to commit. So we only changed, what, seven files? Yeah, that's not bad. So we're going to say git add all the things, commit dash m, upgrading to 3.0, mostly works. And we'll push that out there. And we'll push that out there. Fortunately, I can type reasonably quickly. All right, so we've managed to upgrade something to 3.0. And uh, we fixed that specification thing. I think we're in we're in good shape here. I'm gonna switch gears to something else now. As soon as I answer Mr. Surly Dev's question here, I had a small MVC five project that didn't work. I need to work on another one. It's partially built with two controllers and a couple of actions. I'm only just getting started with MVC. Do you think I should try to rewrite the little one and ASP.NET Core over the weekend as an exercise? Or I should just leave them both in MVC. Uh, well, if it were me, I would probably err toward putting it in Core. Um, and if they're small and it won't take much effort, then, then that's probably the way to go. The reason being that core is the future, right? So it's, if you don't do it now, you're going to end up doing it later. And all the work you put in it between now and later, you're going to have to take that work and move it into core. Whereas if you've just done core now, all your work you do will be in core and you won't have to ever move it again. Um, if it were a big and complicated and, you know, in production app for your company, I wouldn't necessarily be so quick to say that. Um, because the ROI might not be there because the effort involved and the risk involved in moving it. But if it's a small project that's not mission critical that, you know, you could do over the weekend as an exercise, then I don't see why not. All right. There is a coding kata that I found recently. Um, that I already, actually I already cloned this to my repo, so it's github.com or Dallas. Go back to my repositories. And there's this theatrical players refactoring kata, which is forked from Emily, I don't know how to say her last name, Bach, maybe, uh, from her repo. And this actually has uh, starting code in a number of different languages. And I think I'll probably do C sharp. But uh, it also uses something called approval tests, um, which I hadn't used until recently. So I thought it might be interesting to some of you to see how these how this tool works. I've written approval tests myself, but I haven't used this NuGet package um, before I started working on this kata, which I've done once already previously. Um, so let's get started, and I'll show you how this works. This is actually pulled from um, the new refactoring book. So if you go out here and you look for this book, which I recently ordered, um, right there, uh, it's in chapter one of, of Fowler's new refactoring up, upgrade book. So you can grab that book if you want. Um, I'm going to clone this to this computer because I haven't done it on this machine. So we'll just do git clone. I wonder if I can clone her. Do I want to clone mine or do I want to clone hers? What I want to do is start with it and put it into a new place on mine that's just my implementation of it. So what I should probably do is come over here and say that I want a new repository. 
and this will be theatrical players kata attempt. How about that? And we'll make it public. We'll have a readme. We'll have a git ignore. We'll do all these things. We'll say, yes, of course you can steal this code. And I know that I need Azure Pipelines, but sure, why not? Create a repository. Meanwhile, I'm going to clone the other one, which is right there. So now I have that code. And then I'm going to also clone this one for my attempt. Right there. And then we're going to go into here. And we're going to go into here and we're going to grab the C sharp file. Copy. Go to the other one and paste. There we go. And let's get started. All right. Do you have a really good .NET Core getting started example or course that isn't months out of date? Um, I have one on DevIQ, but it is months out of date because it focuses on 2.0. Uh, but that's that's not a bad one. I'm somewhat biased, but it covers all the basics of, of .NET Core and, and startup and middleware and all that good stuff and configuration. Contact service model package. What the heck is that? Continue? No. Continue showing this error? No. And stop having errors. Um, all right. So there's that. Um, I'm sure Pluralsight has courses on ASP.NET Core that, that you could probably check out. Um, the docs are actually quite good. Uh, streaming is okay, but it's not as focused, right? Like it's not a training class, so you're not going to have labs. You're not going to have uh, a focused syllabus. It's going to be whatever the streamer feels like talking about. Um, YouTube, I'm sure you'll find some stuff. So I don't, I don't necessarily have a specific thing, certainly, Dev. Um, the, the one that I would point you toward that I know is reasonable because I did it is my course on DevIQ that almost nobody buys but here you go um, it's 50 bucks it's got a couple modules that are uh, free and it covers this stuff right so it talks about how to install it how to create apps startup middleware DI MVC razor pages testing and clean DDD architecture so all that for the low low price um, you can check that one out. Like I said, it hasn't been updated to 3.x. It's 2.0, 2.1 time frame, so it might be might be good for you. Um, all right. So here's my thing. Let's go. Let's use this one to open up that project. Open a new project. Go back to here to here. My attempt is right here. All right, so let's, I, I already opened this once, didn't I? No, I didn't. Or oh, I did over here. Uh, that's what I did. All right, let's close these ones down. All right, we'll just stick to this one. I have too many versions of Visual Studio right now because the previews. All right, so here we go. Um, output window, you can go away. Go away, thank you. So really Dev was trying to find a coding kata from XP Manchester a couple of years ago and add it to my kata catalog. Please do. Uh, in fact, I could probably add this one to my coding catalog. The thing that this is missing, which I would add to my kata catalog, is instructions. So if we look at my our Dallas kata catalog here, uh, you know, for things like Gilded Rose, which is another refactoring kata, you know, this has the instructions of what you need to do. So like, where does it say? Uh, da, 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 da. Instruction, yeah, okay, here. instructions, right? Here's what you need to do, boom, do that. Um, this kata that I'm working on now, mm, it doesn't really have that. Um, but it has is tests. It has two tests, right? It has a test that says, uh, here's an example of some plays they have things like Hamlet and Otello and As You Like It, and they are tragedies and comedies, and we need to generate an invoice, and we're going to use the statement printer to generate that uh, statement, and then we're going to use this uh, printer to create a result, which is a string, and we're going to verify that result. 
What does that do? Well, I'm glad you asked. This actually uses this NuGet package here. It's actually been around for a while, but I haven't used it very much until recently, called approval tests. And so what approval test does is it looks at your class name and your method name, and it puts those together, and it makes a file called className.methodName.approved.text. And if it all matches up, then it passes the test. All right, so let's go to our test explorer, pin that here for now, and we'll run it. Why are you gray? Why don't you ever let me run that? I don't know why that doesn't update. Oh, I didn't want to debug. <sighs> Stop. Just let me click the button. Okay, it runs, it runs fast, and the tests all pass, right? So what does this do? Well, it verifies that this is the output. Now, which, what's more interesting is when it doesn't match, right? So if I go in here and I change this to have 41 seats filled, and we save it, we rerun the test, it will do this, right? Check it out. Now I've got a diff, and it shows me all the places where it didn't match um, of what I was doing. And in here, here's, here's what is differing, right? There's this approved one, and then there's this received one. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. So let's change my code back and let's talk about what we're going to do. So this was 40. Let's leave that at 40. Now you might think, oh, that's going to be annoying because I'm going to have to clean up all these extra files. But no, no, watch this. When it passes again, if they match, it takes care of cleaning up the, uh, the file that wasn't necessary for you. So that receive file just went away. Um, all right. So what about this other test? Well, this other test, you'll notice, just blows up. Um, that's because there's two things that we need to do for this kata. And like I say, they're not really in the instructions. So I'm going to write up some instructions of my own, I think, uh, and add them to my code kata catalog. But for now, here's what we're going to do. Um, we need to support these two types of plays, history and pastoral pastoral so in the statement printer this is the main thing we're going to be refactoring um it only knows about tragedy and comedy and otherwise it blows up with an exception unknown type right well that's what this thing is currently doing is it's blowing up with an exception unknown type and the only reason the test passes is because it's expecting that all right so we're going to change this test to actually call approvals.verify and make it work all right so that's one thing it needs to do is support those two new types of plays. The other thing um, that you do in this kata is right now the statement printer has um, this result type and it starts out with this string that says hey it's a statement for whoever and then as we go through it we are adding to this result right and we're done we, we add the summary to the result and finally return it. So we have the business logic of how much we should charge for various things with various rules intermixed with how we're going to print out this stuff. And so the other task that we have is for this to support either text output or HTML output. Uh, and so we have to add that support as well. All right, so it turns out that having uh, these approval tests is actually very useful because we can make these refactorings without having to write a whole lot of, of unit tests to get this to work. We can just rely on the approval test. So the first thing that I'm going to do and again, we don't really have any requirements for what it needs to support, um, is I'm going to add those other two types of, of uh, plays. So those were history and pastoral. So we'll come in here and we'll just add them as if they were tragedies. Like that. And this is history. And this is pastoral. And we'll just say that these numbers are different somehow. So this is 20,000. And this is, we'll say, 35. And we'll say this is 35. And this is 45,000. And we'll leave the rest of it alone. All right, now I've added support for this to my system with whatever faux uh, business logic that I wanted to add. And I'm going to take these couple lines here and put them here, and then run my tests again. Now the nice thing about this is I don't have an output file type for this one. 
um, I didn't have to manually handcraft that, right? But it's going to create one for me. So here's here's the received one for that. Now it's it's red. It failed, right? But it's showing me here's what it printed out. And I'm going to say, you know what? Exactly what it printed out. That's what I want it to be. Whatever it's doing, that's what it should do. So this is basically a characterization test, is the term I typically use for it. Um, where now we can say, okay, look, I just want to refactor my code. Um, I want to make sure that I don't break what it's currently doing. And so this is going to tell me that this is doing what it's supposed to do. It's fixing my code output in place so that I can change how my code works and not worry that I've broken what it does. All right. Not that it's relevant to this kata, but isn't that switch statement an example of high cyclomatic complexity? It kind of is, yeah. And it is relevant to this kata, right? Because the refactoring that we're trying to do is to make this this thing better, right? This this line of code is where all the business logic in the whole system lives. Um, and we can actually check its uh, complexity here. If we do analyze, calculate code metrics for the solution, we'll go check the statement printer print method here. So its cyclomatic complexity is currently 12. The recommendation generally is uh, 10 at the highest, right? Lower is better. Um, so yeah, definitely this is, and I just made it worse, obviously, right? I just added like four more ways through it when I copy pasted some code. That's how cyclomatic complexity gets bigger is copy pasting code usually. Um, and so we're gonna refactor this to make it better uh, somehow. Okay, so let's look at the rest of our system under test, right? We've got an invoice. Invoice has a customer and a list of performances. We've got a performance. A performance has a play with, you know, some number of people in the audience. We have a play, which has a name and a type. And we have a printer. And the printer has uh, a dictionary of plays and runs through those performances and pulls the play ID off of the performance to get the play. And then based on the play type, does this other work, right? So somewhere we should probably pull this out of a print method and let the print method be focused on printing and let the calculations for how much we're gonna charge go somewhere else, right? And that sounds to me like that could either go on a statement type, which we don't have currently. We have a statement printer, but we don't have a statement. Um, or I could put it on an invoice, which we do have, right? We're working on invoices here, which have a collection of performances. But this this loop operates on performance.audience and the play, which is part of that performance. So let's see, does performance actually have a play or just a play ID? Just a play ID. So performance doesn't have the play itself to work from. So the play, if we told the play how many people were at it, it would have all the information it needs, right? Um, because the only thing it needs to know is audience, audience count, essentially. And then if I know what type of play it is, it can do its thing. So instead of having this switch statement here, right, I could say something like um, this amount plus equal play dot, um, I don't even know what this is, calculate cost, calculate revenue. I'm not sure what this is, but let's do calculate, let's call it amount, uh, perf dot audience. All right, so we can do that refactoring and then control dot to generate that code. And then we can take this exact switch statement now and put it over there and just cut it right out and then go to here, which is not implemented and paste this in and say int this amount equals zero. And then everywhere we're saying play.type, we're actually just looking for type. So control H on that and swap it out for nothing and nothing. All right, and everywhere we see perf.audience, that's just gonna be audience. Those all look good, boom. And then we need to return something when we're done here, right? Return this amount. All right, so that should work, I hope. Just a viewer is talking about the open-closed principle. 
principal, uh, which also applies here. Yeah, because right now, for me to add another one of these uh, types of plays, I have to touch statement printer, which is bad. Now I've fixed that, so now I have to touch play, which really isn't much better. Um, but notice that my, test, my tests all pass. So this refactoring, this minor move stuff into here part, worked. Um, and while we're here, uh, let's go to that there, right? And let's let's do a commit. Um, git add dot git commit dash n uh, moved calculate into play. And I also added support for the other play types, but that's fine. And we'll push this up. Good. Okay. So now we're back in here, and we need to say. What can we do about this complexity? And at the same time, we also have over here, there's this notion of volume credits. And those are also varying by play type. So we probably want to do something about that as well. Um, so which one should we do first? Well, I think since we're in the process of moving stuff to play that really belongs there and not in this print method, um, we'll do the volume credits as well. So we'll take all of that. Um, and pull it out into another method. So control dot extract method get volume credits. Okay, now that's just here as a private static and it needs to know perf, but really it only needs to know the audience. Um, so here this can pass in perf dot audience and now this can just be int audience. And then that becomes that, and that becomes that. All right, so that's that. Passing in volume credits. Why am I even doing that? Um, I don't want this plus equal to be here. I want this to just be return. No, I don't want it to be return. Um, let's see. Int volume credits should be a local. Right, and then if we have some, we'll add them there, and we'll add them there as well, like that. And then we'll return them. I don't need them there anymore because I can plus equal them here. Right? No overload takes that. Right? Okay succeeds run everything still works all right so nothing's broken that's good um, but of course I don't want this to be here I want this to be a public method on my play so we'll just cut this out of here go to my play hey thanks for the fellow Imtal hope I got your name close put this here public. Now it can't be static anymore because it's going to use the play's type. It doesn't need the play anymore because it is the play. Um, and so that play.type just becomes type. Alright. Save that. Come back over here. This just becomes credits Like that. Okay. Build again. And run the test again. And we're good. And since we're good, it's a good time to do another commit. Let's git add dot, git commit dash m, moved volume credit calc to play. Boom. Okay. Now, um, we get to play with the amount, we do that, and we print stuff, print stuff. Okay, so now mostly all that's left here is printing things with a little bit of amount tracking. Um, what do I do with this amount? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, so I need that, and I need volume credits. Those are displayed down here. Okay. So let's go back to play. How can we clean this up a little better? Um, anytime you see a class that has a type like this, that should tell you, it should be a, a hint to you that there's a, a problem here with um, how this is working and you could probably use polymorphism 
you know, to to have a better design. So let's uh, let's make this a little shorter by using some auto properties. Hang on. That's not what I want, is it? Use auto property. Yeah. There we go. That's better. Perfect. All right. So that cleans that up. Um. Listen, Ardell's. Oh, that's that's my bot. My bot's working. Nice. All right. So this calculate amount switches on the type. We probably don't want it to switch on the type. So what we're going to do instead is have a calculate amount that works for a particular type of play. So let's say that we had a tragedy play. Tragedy play inherits from play. Right? So it has all the behavior of a play. And let's say that this was virtual. It's a virtuous method. Then we could override it here. Calculate. Right? And then the tragedy stuff is just that. And we just come in here and we paste that in here and we say, no, we're going to do this. Return this amount. And start it off as an int. Right? So now, if we are a tragedy play, we're in good shape. What else does this need? Move type. Um, sure, generate. Fine. Oh, but check it out. Uh, we don't want to pass in the type when we're newing up a tragedy play. It's going to always be a tragedy. So we can force that type. The other thing we can do to force that is we can say, you know what, you really don't need to change the name of a play once it's created. It's probably a little better if that's immutable. So we can lock it down like that. So this is called constructor chaining, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so when I new up a tragedy play, I can pass it in its name, and it will chain to its base, which is play, and it'll pass in the same name here that I just set, and then whatever this is, right? So now it's still going to come into play to, to set these values and these properties to be available. Does anyone else sit here watching Steve think, yeah, that makes sense, and then when they do it, they look at the screen and say, oh, what do I do now? Well, the reason why I know how to do this is because I've done it a bunch of times, right? This kata is meant to be a way for you to practice and get get better at it, so... That's because real world stuff is way more convoluted. It is. It really is. But here's the thing. Build your real world stuff with tiny little classes that do one thing, and you too can be focusing on this much code instead of 3,000 lines of code. That's the trick. Even when you're writing updates to legacy code, you need to you know take some little piece and yank it out and make some tiny piece that you're working on. All right, so... This is just a way to do polymorphism. It's not the only approach to this kata, but it's it's my go-to for this one because when I see a switch statement like this, my mind immediately says, we should use polymorphism for that. Don't switch on a string, uh, but instead have a different subtype for it. And either you're going to have a different type of the thing, or you're going to have a strategy for the calculation that you're doing. Right. So I could have calculate amount uh, delegate to a uh, you know a play cost strategy that gets injected into play, and then instead of having a tragedy play, I'd have a tragedy calculator strategy, right, or something like that, that I would inject in. But let's just go down this path and see what it looks like. So I no longer need that, right, that case tragedy goes away. Um, but how's it going to work when, when the code is calling into this? Well, uh, I'm going to create a new helper method to create me these different types. So we're going to say public static play uh, create play string name string type right name type yeah so this looks just like that uh, but we're gonna make this private right now you can't just create a play that's that's no longer allowed and this is gonna just say return a new play name type like that right too easy. Uh, oh wait, but if type equals tragedy, return new tragedy play with your name. Like that. So now when we call create play to create our plays, it should work. So surly dev is now lost. Alright, the reason why I'm doing this, surly dev, is I need to make sure that when you call calculate amount, 
you're not calling it from a tragedy anymore, right? Because I took tragedy's code out of here. So I need to force the users of this uh, API, the users of my classes, into calling the right type, okay? In my tests, which right now are the only place that this code's being used, everywhere I'm, I'm just newing up a play, right? And so there's nothing that would prevent them from newing up a play and calling tragedy like this, and then when they run this, it wouldn't work because I yanked that out of the out of the calculation up here in play. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a factory method, that's what this is called, for how you create plays, and I'm forcing it so that when you try and create a tragedy, you don't get just a play, you get a tragedy play. And so I can take this create play method, which I intentionally gave it the same signature as the constructor, because it's going to make my life easy when I come over here. And this new play open paren becomes play dot create play open paren. All right, and so I can take that. Um, I can take. Let's see. I can take that and Control C, and I can take that and Control H, and paste and replace all, and say OK. And now all my tests build again. All right, and I'm doing this in a baby step because I want to make sure that I can I can still build. All right, now this. Play. This needed to be protected, not private, because I want my subtypes to be able to call it still. All right. So now that builds, and let's verify this still works. Okay. So everything's still good. Um, so the thing is, I didn't want to have to do all the work of yanking out this whole switch statement, which, again, in real-world code, I agree with you, this could be really freaking big and gnarly and hard to do anything with, right? Um, so I'm going to take the tiniest, smallest little case out of the switch that I can and pull that out into its own separate class that just does that one thing. All right? And so that's what we've done here. We've said, you know what, I have this new class right here. It's brand new. wasn't in my code before. Nobody else knows about it. It's not, nothing else depends on it. So I can do whatever I want with it. I am free to design this thing however I want. And so I can make sure that it's unit testable. I can make sure that it follows single responsibility and other solid principles. Right, and in this case, all I'm doing is copy pasting this code in to do to do this stuff. Right, um, overriding the default behavior, and and I prove that it works because all my tests still pass. Right, and now I have a pattern that I'm following. I'm just going to lather, rinse, repeat. Right, and do it a few more times. So it's hard to focus on the tree over the forest, which is also typically on fire. I love that legendary. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was thinking of implementing the same kind of concept for the VIP greetings in Mr. Announcer Bot. Yeah, if you've got a bot that has a whole giant switch statement of, of types of things it does, this would be another place where you could have a different um, announcement strategy or response strategy or whatever. Uh, switch statements, generally, you want to get rid of. You know, you should have very few switch statements in your code. Where I'm going to have one is right here. This if statement, in, a, in about five minutes, that's going to turn into a switch statement that's going to basically look just like this. Or, or I'll just do a bunch of ifs, but it's going to be a switch on type, and instead of doing actual work, it's going to return instances. It's going to be a factory with a switch. Legendary. Steve, when doing this sort of breakdown, do you tend to keep the classes in a single file or separate them? And I, I start out single file like this um, oftentimes because it's easy for me to do this. I'm going to say control dot and move. All right, so I'll move them as I get them done and where I want them, um, especially if I'm doing some kind of training. If I'm, you know, doing a conference talk or I'm streaming, it's easier for me to show you all the code in one place that I can just scroll up and down than uh, alt-tabbing or whatever between different tabs because that gets harder to follow and it's easier to get lost as the viewer, I think. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. Um, and I probably shouldn't have moved this just yet, but let me just steal this code here. Come back over here where I can have it all on one screen again paste in tragedy play, but now it's going to be history play, right? So history play like that, and history play has this code right there instead of this code right here, and copy that, paste that, make this say history, make this say int, that looks good enough. Um, now I no longer need this case history, so my switch is getting smaller. My cyclomatic complexity is dropping also, and do this like this for now. We'll switch it to a switch statement here in a minute. 
history play. All right, let's build it. Let's run our tests one more time. Let's look at that uh, cyclomatic complexity now. Okay, here we are, and statement printer print complexity is now two. So it got a lot better. Uh, if we look at play, play has a calculate amount method, and it's down to six. All right, so we want per method, we want the cyclomatic complexity to stay under 10. Um, and we're definitely moving in the right direction, right? If we look at uh, specifically history play, calculate amount, two, right? These are easy to, t easy to follow. Why is the type field relevant still? Has it not been superseded by the object type? Uh, it's a good question. It's still relevant now because we're not done. Um, but when we're done with this, after pulling out a couple more of these, um, we'll look at that. So for now, let's do history play becomes a pastoral play. that, copy, paste, pastoral, and we need that right there to go right here. Keep the int this time. That looks good. Now we can make this a switch, perhaps. I don't even know the syntax for switch hardly because I never use it. Switch. And then case uh, pastoral return new pastoral with a name. And that should be it, right? Why are you indented? I don't need a break. Or is it? It doesn't like that. Tragedy, tragedy. that case history return that case else is that what it is no, or just that we'll keep the um, default uh, exception all right so now we're good. And then type, type. Okay, uh, so we got one more of those to do, which is going to be comedy. So let's just throw that on here while we're here. Comedy. Comedy play. And let's jump up here and create a comedy play. I just need to steal its logic. All right, now that all should work. This thing should just go away. And I think I can totally get rid of it here in a second, but we'll we'll verify. So that works, and that works, amazing. All right, so now this becomes abstract, right? abstract, which you may not use that often, just means any subtype must define it, um, must must implement it, but uh, it's not implemented here. And I also want to make this class now abstract, because you can't use abstract keyword inside of a non-abstract type. So you can't just new up a play anymore. Now you have to implement a subtype of play. Every play has to be some kind of play. All right, because of that, every play is going to have its own custom behavior for how it does calculate amount. All right, so now we'll go ahead and move these to their own places, which is pretty easy to do. That's why I like starting with things in the same file and then just control dot enter to move them into their respective place. Um, let's get volume credits. You notice this says if the type is comedy, it's going to do something different that's going to be an opportunity for us to do something there as well. So we'll look at that next. So let's go here and run this. And everything's still green. Let's do another quick commit. Get add. Move to calculation to subtypes. Push that up. 
All right, now let's do volume credits. All right, so that could be a, a base type as well. We can make this a virtual int get volume credits. And this is where we were gonna say, here is our default behavior, um, but we're gonna add this additional behavior if it's a comedy type. So we're gonna take this, copy it, go into comedy play and override get volume credits. And instead of returning base, we're gonna say int credits equal whatever the base behavior is, but we're gonna add on to that. And we're gonna say that goes there. And I don't need an if statement. Right? That's the beauty of polymorphism. It gets rid of if statements. It gets rid of uh, cyclomatic complexity. So I don't need this comment because obviously I'm in comedy play. So I don't need a comment that says it's only for comedy plays. Um, I just need to tack on a couple more things, and then I return them. All right, and we'll control dot on that, and control KD to format, and we're all set. Um, let's go back to play. Let's get rid of all this type-specific code. Um, and I don't really need any of this. I really just need volume credits. I just need to return that. Right, because that's all I'm doing. So that got a lot cleaner. And did I break anything? Nope, still good. So even though I don't have unit test coverage on this project, I'm only working with the, the output. I'm still able to refactor pretty freely because my output basically has all the information that I need to know if my algorithms have messed anything up. Um, if I wasn't sure about that, I could of course write a lot more of these tests with a bunch more different outputs. Um, but for now, I think I'm, I'm covering everything. All right, so that gets us to where we've refactored statement uh, pretty well. The next step is I want to be able to, have you seen Karnak for keys? No, I haven't. Would that be helpful for you guys? Um, Let's open that URL. Car oh, I think I've heard of this. Yeah. Um, sure. What do I need to do here? Set up that exe, maybe? Stay up to date, sound free. Yada, yada, yada. Um, let's try that. What are the odds that this works? question is which machine does it need to run on because right now I'm remoting into another box that's sitting like right over there so probably this needs to run on my stream machine which is the machine that I'm on here so that's good and I said run it but I don't know where it's running it didn't just silently start working did it oh wait, it did Look, there's control C. Okay, well, there you go. That's running. Interesting. Left button, OEM, whatever. Okay. Interesting. All right, legendary Moo, we'll try it. All right, I've got about 15 minutes left uh, before I want to wrap up my stream. So let's see what's the best way for us to do uh, printing, either text based or HTML based. There's a couple different options here, right? I've got a statement printer. I could say, well, this could be uh, another opportunity to do polymorphism, and I could say, well, I've got a base statement printer, and I've got a text statement printer, an HTML statement printer. That'd be an option. I could go the uh, the flag and if check route. I could do something like, you know, bull, uh, you know, print HTML, right? That's a choice. That's an option. I'm not necessarily a fan of that option. Um, the other thing you could do is you could just have something that, uh, this thing uses, so there's this notion of uh, composition over inheritance, right? So instead of me using inheritance to get different behavior on this, I can compose it out of different classes um, and, and give them different responsibilities. So statement printer's responsibility is all this logic of how to go and get the amounts and print them out in a certain order and stuff like that. But how it prints them out or how it formats that, that could be somebody else's job. Um, 
and that would be where we could compose our solution from a statement printer and a text formatter or an HTML formatter. Um, and so I think I like that approach. Um, so the first thing to do is come up with a name for the thing that we want to use. And I'm thinking like formatter, outputter, or something like that. So we're going to make an interface um, called I statement, we'll say formatter, statement formatter. Right? And a statement formatter just needs to have a void append line method, I think. Uh, and that's about it. And then it just needs a string get statement, maybe, or we'll say get, uh, get result, right? And do we need to pass anything? We probably need to pass something into this, string text. All right, so now we have a statement formatter, and this guy can use one of those. Constructor, I'm going to add a uh, I statement formatter, formatter, control dot, initialize a field, underscore formatter, all right, now everywhere that we're saying result is equal to or plus equal to something, um, notice these all have whack backslash ends on them. So they are basically doing a, a line at a time. So uh, let's do our, our default behavior so we don't break anything, which is going to be a text formatter. So all right, so let's do public class text statement formatter, I statement formatter, control dot, implement. All right, and we're going to use a string builder here. So, um, yeah, string builder, sb equals new, sb equals new, string builder, like that, using text. Okay. And when we append a line to this, we just do sb dot append line text. And then we just return our string builder. All right, so we can do that. And so our first step that we want to do is before we even worry about HTML, we want to get the text stuff working using a, a, uh, a collaborator, right? Using something else that we're composing. You think it needs installed on the machine with the IDE? Oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Um, let's try, pull that up here. Do download set up probably installing viruses on all my machines. Alright, so it just silently does its thing, presumably, and then we can highlight stuff and be like, Control KD. Oh look, you see it. You see it? Yeah, cool. Alright. There you go. You happy now? Legendary? Legendary. Um I'm impressed with the ease of install. Okay, I know, right? It's like there's no dialogue. There's no, are you sure? Read this license. It's just like, boom, it's in there. There's no turning back. Um, DevIQ does not have a course on refactoring. This is the best part of the stream today. Might be a good idea. Um, I could post it on DevIQ as a free course, but uh, I have three different courses on Pluralsight on refactoring. So if that's your thing, go go watch my Pluralsight course. Um, all right, so what are we going to do here? You keep indulging my side quest, yes. Well, that's that's what makes streaming different from me just uh, doing a conference presentation or a uh, plural site course. Is there's some interactivity here. Um, all right, so I want to take this line and get rid of it and basically call formatter dot whatever I called that append line. All right, so this just becomes formatter dot append line and then all the stuff that is going on right here. So I'll take all of that and put it right here and get rid of that and do that. Right, and then screw it up. Well, I need one more paren, maybe. Da -da -da -da. Culture, oh, why is there a semicolon there? That doesn't make any sense. I've managed to screw this up. Those were two different things. Ah, interesting. What is that being used for? That's down there. Okay. All right, all right. So I really only need this bit. Sorry. Get that out. Stick that there. For some reason I thought that was all one statement. And the other thing.
Visual Studio, you're being crazy here. I swear I'm clicking in the right spot. Get rid of that. Do that. Finally. All right. Honest, I know how to code. Um, all right. So at the end of it, it's going to be get result. So this is formatter dot get result. Like that. Okay. And all these other plus equal things are. Let's see. I don't need the backslash n because that'll add too many too many lines. Um, this becomes formatter dot append line. Now here's an interesting trick for you that those of you that don't know it. Dot, right, a pen line's the first thing, so I could just hit tab. But if it weren't, I can say dot A L. Now notice this. Look closely. See how it's the A and the L are capital letters? So it's it's highlighted those and searched down to things that have that. Alright, so this works well, you know, like I have now a uh, text statement formatter, TSF. Right? So if I want to new one of those up, I could be like var formatter equal new T S F and it jumps right to it. So if you have these fairly long type names because you're being descriptive, you can do that capital letter thing to, to find them very quickly. Yeah, just type the capital letters. Are you not using IntelliCode? Um, I don't know. I'm using Visual Studio. Is IntelliCode built into that? Formatter dot append line. Do that. Do that. String dot format. All that. Paste that. Okay, get rid of the carriage return. Get rid of the result plus equal. And let's do that twice more here. It's really just here. Formatter.append line. Open, do all that. Close, get rid of that. And then one more time. Copy that, paste it there. Close it there. I can use string interpolation on this when I further refactor it, but I want to get to the point where I can build again. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm using IntelliCode if it's the built-in feature. Um, right, so, oh yeah. Alright, so here's the thing. If you start using the strategy design pattern, which is what I'm doing. Um, let's get back here. So this, this is dependency injection. It's also known as the strategy design pattern. If you try and do this in your production code, you're going to end up with what I just did, which is, hey, all the things that we're used to calling statement printer by just newing it up are no longer happy. They're going to blow up and they're going to say, I don't have that thing that you wanted me to inject. Um, not there at all, C sharp. Okay, cool. And play by play series on Pluralsight. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing a play by play on Pluralsight. That would be fun. I haven't done one of those before. Okay. Back to uh, situation at hand. How do you fix that problem, right? I want to be able to inject this thing when I need to, but I also want it to work the way it always did. And so that's where you can use constructor overloads. So CTOR for constructor, tab, tab. And then again, I'm going to do constructor chaining. Only this time I'm, I'm chaining to myself. So instead of saying chain to base, I'm going to say chain to this, which is me. And I'm going to pass in the thing that does what I want it to do, which is that uh, text statement formatter right there. Okay, so now when things try and call this the way they always did, it's going to do what they always did, right? They Previously, the default behavior was text, so I'm going to hard code the default behavior for now um, to be a text statement formatter. Now, if you continue refactoring your system and you start using dependency injection more and, you know, making it more loosely coupled, eventually you'll pull this out, right, and you won't have this there anymore. But this is a useful step in a legacy system to be able to get things to still work, which is where we are now. So I should be able to run my tests and they blow up. And they blow up because there's an extra line at the bottom that appears. Um, so how did I do that? Let's go to statement printer. And I forgot that right there. That's all it is. Build that. And once again, these uh, approval tests are saving me. And everything's green, we're good. All right, now, we've got five minutes left. Can we do an HTML formatter in five minutes? I think we can if we set our standards low. Uh, by which I mean, you know what HTML looks like to me? HTML looks a lot like this. 
Boom. You want an HTML, I give you HTML. Uh, and let's go back to our Solution Explorer. Yeah, legendary moo. No more side quests. It's all your fault. All right, let's go in here. Statement printer tests. Um, we want some HTML tests. So I think those could be in the same file. So let's just do this. Boom. Test statement. Uh, HTML. Example. And now here we're going to pass in a new HTML statement formatter. And that's the only change we need to make. Let's build that. And let's let's run all the tests. And it fails. Because HTML example, if we look over here at our approval test, uh, it has stuff here with BR tags, but nothing here. And you know what? I think that looks good. I think that, that looks like a wonderful example of an HTML report. So we're going to say uh, delete the approved one and mark the received one as approved. All right, and then rerun our test. Boom, green. All right, I'm gonna do that one more time. Uh, come over here, verify it works with our new play types. Um, and you know, if I were smart, I'd use a theory for this and not copy paste this, but test statement with new play types. Test uh, statement HTML. Blah, 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 new HTML formatter, run all the things again. Uh, the refactoring book is called Refactoring, second edition, Martin Fowler. Look at all this typing I'm doing. Um, all right, so we're going to do the same thing here, new types right there, br, 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 looks perfect. Um, so we're going to make that be the approved one and run this one more time. Boom. All right. So now we're going to commit. Added HTML formatter. Boom. Done. With three minutes to spare, what else would we clean up? Well, we'd come in here and we'd say, you know what, string format's kind of old school. I really think that should be string interpolation. And we just do this and this and this. That's a little cleaner. Save that. Make sure we're still good. We are. And repeat that a few more times. So. I'm not really using this culture info. I probably should be, but it's just hard coded anyway. So um, let's just do this. Dollar sign. Copy that to be play.name. Copy that to be the thing right there. It's getting a little harder to read. How many seats? That's audience. Like that. All right, that looks doable. All right, I can't build it now because I got rid of this culture info, so let's just keep at it. Dollar sign, convert to decimal. Take that, throw it in there. Get rid of that. And one more time, dollar sign, volume credits, into that, boom. And does it pass the test? It does. So um, that's not terrible. There's probably still some cleanup I can do. Um, looking for opportunities. Let's see, we can move these things to their own places. Control dot, enter. Control dot, enter. Get rid of unused usings. All right, but that's that's me spending an hour on a refactoring kata. Um, 
moving some stuff around. So, Surly Dev is uh, happy with some one eyed alien, I guess. I haven't seen that one. Code by hype. Uh, Alright, let's do one last commit. Get add dot, commit dash n. Uh, refactoring to use string interpolation. Push. Um, I may not have it on here, but there is a cool tool that you can use. Might be, might have it. Yeah, right, that's my attempt. I don't see it here. Uh, what is it called? There's a thing. Hmm. I want to show it to you if I can. Um, let's go over here. Do I have it here? I think I have it here. I don't know. I don't see it. All right, there's a there's a nice visualizer. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, GitHub visualize commit um, animated. Let's see if that finds it for me. GitHub visualizer. Is that it? Nope, 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 nope. Um, visually get up commits. Oh no, no. Git flow. Is that it? So I built React apps, visualize basically in Git flow. I don't think that's it either. Man. It's not yours. Commits, animated, CSS. Um, it was called Git History, wasn't that it? GitHub History Visualization. Maybe. Was it this? No, it's still not that. Not that. a single file and it had a Chrome plugin um, hmm I hate it when I can't find something that I've used is it git lens no that's for Visual Studio Code let's see if we search for a Chrome plugin Any of you guys remember? Basically, I know I've got it installed on one of my machines, but I don't have it. Apparently, I don't have it here. Um, it would let you go. Maybe, maybe I have to go to a particular file, and then it'll show up. I thought I had it. Let's go to here. Oh, there it is, right there. All right, I do have it. Check it out. Open and get history. All right, so performance isn't really the one we want. Let's look at statement. Statement printer. This is part of why I was committing as we went. All right, so we can go here. We can make this a little bit bigger. All right, so here's here's where we started, right? Um, and here I'd already moved calculate, right? Move calculate into play, so there's not as much here. And then as we slide to the right, it'll animate and show you. Like here, we we had the volume stuff was here, and now we just moved the volume stuff. Yeah, this is a Chrome plugin. Um, it goes uh, GitHub you, information you can find here, I think. So let me just paste this in. GitHub Git History X Y Z. All right, now you just use your arrow keys, right? Arrow to the right. Here's what it looks like now. We added all those other things, um, and it kind of highlights the parts that changed, right? So all these lines that are bright are the lines that that we recently changed, and then jump here, here's where I just changed them all to use string interpolation. So you can kind of go back and forth and see what they look like. Um, if you want to see a different file, you can just adjust it up here. Uh, or obviously go, let's go look at play. All right, open and get history. And start from the beginning over here. So here's where we first move calculate amount in. 
and then we shrunk it down and now you can see here's create play and now it's abstract and then cleaned up some other stuff and added the volume credits right so it's a nice way to visualize changes that you're making it's actually a little better if you're not following solid principles and you just got one ginormous file because you can kind of see everything that happened to that one big file um, but it's useful regardless so check it out yeah it's just uh, they're just a, their own page and they use whatever path you give it here to go look up that file on github and then they let you navigate through the history using your arrow keys instead of you know having to use github's way which is not nearly as nice and with that let's go find somebody to uh, to raid here so who's who's around fritz is still going is he really I thought somebody said he uh, raided somebody else. Oh, uh, it is Imperial. Okay. So what's Imperial doing? Ed, Ed's usually wrapping up around the same time I am. Um, he's got 19 people watching him. Let's go. Let's go to Ed. He may be about done, but. That's all right. So I'm gonna raid you all over to Ed. He's ta he's doing blazer stuff. All right. So I gotta go. I've got some other stuff I gotta get done. Thank you guys. Have a nice weekend. Check out uh, .conf next week. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ping me. I'm on uh, Twitter as Ardalis. So see you guys later.